Okay, I'd like to uh, <coughs> start the meeting with the Board and Advisory Board. Um, first on the agenda, any public comment, questions from the public related to topics that are not of the meeting agenda, but are related to authority or responsibility of the Board and Advisory Board? Any, okay, from the public? Not seeing any. Next is approve the minutes. Just with the exception that I was here. With the exception that Mike was <laughs> here. I'll second. Okay, we got first and second with a change. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Next, the ADEA standards, who must comply, and enforcement study session. Thank you, Chairman members of the board bring it to you this afternoon uh, ADA standards of all the building codes and standards we are obligated to enforce within the city and within other jurisdictions within the country probably the most confusing are ADA standards the 2010 ADA standards they are applicable standards for all new construction, alterations, remodels, et cetera, within the city of Salina. And this is also the same standards that are reflected in the state of Kansas under KAR 58-1301 to 58-1309. Same regulations, same reflection as to the 2010 ADA standards. What we need to realize is that ADA standards are issued under civil rights law they are not a building code, and they are not enforced like one. Oftentimes that's overlooked or confused. The enforcement authority of the ADA standards continues to lead to confusion, speculation as to who is the authority, who does enforce, and the purpose of this presentation this afternoon is to try to clarify some of these items. Again, we enforce the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. Now, what does that mean? What, what composes that to make it the 2010 standards? For Title II, there's two different titles within the ADA standards. Title II is for your state, local government facilities, whether it's a city government, county government, state, et cetera. They all un fall under Title II. Uh, 28 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 35.151, plus the 2004 ADAG is what gives us now the 2010 ADA Standards for Accessible Design. The compliance date, date or for this 2010 standard as it relates to Title II is March 15, 2012. Any construction on or after that date must comply. And this is for all state, local government facilities. The state, the county, local governments, we're all subject to ADA standards, regardless whether it's a commercial entity or whether it's a governmental entity. And we must comply with ADA standards in construction, all of our alterations. <coughs> Public facilities, for example, are our courthouses, city, county offices, et cetera. And I do want you to know, federal facilities, federal government, they are not covered by the ADA. And that brings a big question to oftentimes to people is, so well, why isn't the federal government covered? Actually, they are covered, but it's through the Architectural Barriers Act. It's an earlier law that they follow that has very similar standards as the 2010 ADA standards for that we're speaking of this evening. Again, any government entity, we all know this to be our city county building, as such it must be ADA compliant. And this is a bit of a narrative on what is the Architectural Barriers Act of 1968. 
again, ADA standards came from Civil Rights Act of 1968 and is a form of that and it has again evolved over the years to different standards and the different degrees of the standards over the years. This is indeed an act of Congress and that all United States federal government is mandated to be accessible to the general public. There are four federal agencies that are responsible for setting this standard. Department of Defense, Department of Housing and Urban Development, we know as HUD, General Services Administration, we know as GSA, and the U.S. Postal Service. So any of these entities that fall under the federal government umbrella are to comply with the Architectural Barriers Act, and they still do to this day. Now we go to Title III. Title III, this is where it gets a little more complicated. This is basically all your commercial entities, all commercial facilities, and that's composed of 28 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 36, Subpart D, and the 2004 ADAG. Both of those combined provide us with a 2010 ADA standard for accessible design that we enforce now. The compliance date for Title III, again, it was March 15, 2012. Anything on or after that date must comply. Prior to that date, there were other standards. There was a 1991 standard for accessible design. Some of that has been followed. So some buildings without modifications that are pre-existing to this March 15, 2012, again, are compliant under a different issue or a different uh, date of the code than what the 2010 is referencing. It could be the 91 standards, it could be a combination of ADAG, 2004 ADAG, and the 91 standards, plus others. Now, in the private sector, these apply to places, accommodation, all commercial facilities, and they fall within 12 categories. 12 categories are specifically stated, and I include, the, include those in a separate slide, but we're basically looking at any type of store, shop, restaurant, bar, sales, rental establishment, service establishments, theaters, places of lodging, places of worship, et cetera. Almost any type of business that you can think of that serves the public are included in the 12 categories. And it's regardless of size, doesn't matter how many square feet you have, et cetera. The specific 12 categories are, one is the places of lodging, <coughs> that's our motels, our hotels, inns, et cetera. Anything that, any establishment that serves food or drink, which is our restaurants or bars, typically. Places of exhibition or entertainment, that includes theaters, concert halls, stadiums. Places of public gathering, auditoriums, convention centers, lecture halls. Sales or rental establishments, shopping centers, our bakeries, grocery stores, hardware stores, service establishments, the laundromat, dry cleaner, bank, barber, beauty shop, travel services, professional offices, medical offices, pharmacies, hospitals, funeral parlors, public transportation terminals, depots or stations. Now, this does not include air transportation. That falls under a different category and that's controlled through the FAA. Places of public display or collection are museums, libraries, galleries, places of recreation, Parks, zoos, amusement parks, places of education, our nursery schools, elementary, secondary, undergraduate, postgraduate, public or private. Social service center establishments or daycare centers, our senior citizen centers, homeless shelters, food banks, adoption agencies, and places of exercise or recreation, which is our health spas, bowling area, uh, bowling alleys, gyms, golf courses, etc. So, as you can see, virtually anything commercial related that serves the public must be ADA accessible. These 12 categories 
cover just about any establishment that we can think of. Our commercial also is our office buildings, our factories, warehouses, manufacturing plants, whatever the case may be, anything that affects commerce. And here are some of our local examples that must be ADA compliant. Motels, shopping centers, et cetera. Any medical facilities. Now as it applies to housing, and this gets a little more complex. A private residential housing is not covered by the 2010 ADA standards. Apartments, single family residences, condominiums, townhomes. Now this means private residential housing is not covered by it is 100% privately financed, owned and operated without any federal <coughs> funds or whatever necessary to build that facility. So no funding was obtained from the federal government to build these facilities or still used to supplement rent, et cetera. If that <coughs> happens, they are, do fall under the category. Government owned and operated housing, certain privately owned facilities that provide housing are subject to ADA, and we'll get into that in the next slide. Government owned means that uh, student, faculty housing, say at universities, employee housing, nursing homes, temporary emergency housing, uh, social service facilities, uh, such as we see with homeless shelters, those would fall under the category of government loan owned and operated. Now in the private sector, it only applies to social service establishment and housing provided for places of education. In addition to that, places of public accommodation located within the residential buildings uh, such, say you have a rental office in your apartment complex, someone's working in that sales office or your rental office uh, every day, well then that particular portion of it would have to be ADA compliant even though it is privately owned and operated. They will be subject to the standards. They do not apply to individually owned or leased housing in the private sector that is not used as a public accommodation, including single family homes, apartments, and condominiums. So yes, it gets more and more complex the more we get into the ADA standards as to what is covered, what is not covered. This is, and again, this is a brief overview. In subsequent study sessions, and I plan to s do several of them specifically for ADA because it, it can be so confusing, we'll get into more of the meat and potatoes of it, not just an overview of what we have here. This is just give you a basic understanding of how complex and how reaching ADA standards are and how we must comply. Again, we're looking at places of public accommodation, whether it's within the apartment complex that's privately owned or not. This could also be s used as a leasing area, a sales area. Now, is it applicable to most other housing? As we say, it doesn't apply for most private residential housing, but many, many types of multifamily are subject to the design requirements of the Fair Housing Act and HUD 504 regulation. So just because we're saying that that private residential housing, say apartment complex, may not fall under the authority of the 2010 ADA standards, there are still other things that must be met. So we're looking at the Fair Housing Act may come into play, HUD 504 regulations may come into pl play. So there's other, other areas that we need to look at. For example, the Fair Housing Act requires all covered multifamily dwellings. And they define that as being four more units with one or more elevators and all ground floor units in a building containing four more units without an elevator to be accessible and usable by people with disabilities. 
So if it was designed and constructed for its first use after March the 13th, 1991, Fair Housing Act comes into play as well, which makes it a little more confusing. So now we have three other entities we need to look at when we're looking at apartment complexes, et cetera. Building completed after March 13, 1991. With elevators in four more units, they must, must, must include these following items. One is a wheelchair accessible route through the unit, accessible light switches, thermostats, other environmental controls, reinforced bathroom walls to accommodate the grass bars, kitchens and bathrooms that are usable by wheelchair bound individuals. And that falls under the Fair Housing Act and that will come into play. And here we get down to how are these enforced? Who is the authority? Department of Justice is the authority. None other, Department of Justice. These are not building code. We cannot enforce these like a building code. They constitute design and construction requirements that are issued under the Civil Rights Law of 1968. ADA mandates include accessibility provisions are enforced throughout the Department of Justice through investigations of complaints filed with federal agencies or through litigation brought by private individuals or the federal government. So the enforcement, for instance, if there's a complaint, uh, whether it's a resident, an owner, who, whomever it may be, there's a complaint apartment complex per se. Well, it's not ADA compliant. We don't have sufficient ADA parking. There's not an accessible route. Who's going to investigate that? Department of Justice is going to investigate that. There's a formal complaint procedure that is filled out and filed with them, and they will be the ones enforcing and investigating and making a ruling on whether or not that is the case. Keep in mind, there's no plan review or permitting process, so this becomes a little more complex, confusing. The ADA does not have plan review or permitting process, nor are building departments required or authorized by the ADA to enforce the ADA standards. So we, as a governmental entity, as a local building department, we are not authorized, nor do the ADA or the Department of Justice give any jurisdiction a uh, certificate or whatever, mind you, that gives us the authority to enforce the ADA standard. In fact, the state and local officials do not have said authority on behalf of the federal government. The Department of Justice is the enforcement authority. They will do all investigations, they will research all complaints, et cetera, and they will make the final decisions on those. Quite honestly, many, many building departments throughout the nation have a disclaimer on their plan review checklist, on their plan review process clearly indicating ADA compliance is not part of the approval process. So where does the approval process, how do we know that we're gonna be ADA compliant? As jurisdictions, we look at every plan that comes in. We look at the 2010 ADA standards. We look at the building code and see the ADA is being met. The final authority of that, however, is the Department of Justice. For example, you get a plan looked at and reviewed and approved by the building department, you assume or you may assume that when you walk out the door and you build your facility that you are 100% ADA compliant. That should not be assumed. Department of Justice, again, is the enforcement authority. So don't think that just because you have that building permit that you are gonna be 100% ADA compliant. That may or may not be the case. 
we do reviews as intensive as we possibly can, but again, the Department of Justice does not give a local department or a local building department or enforcement authority on behalf of the federal government. They, w they will not do that. So who is ultimately responsible? All entities covered by law, which means basically the owners, they are ultimately responsible for ensuring compliance with ADA standards of new construction and alteration. This is also done in conjunction with the design professional, architects, engineers, et cetera, that advise them as to what they need on their projects. So every set of plans we had come in, we are already provided from the architect the ADA components for that particular project for us to review. But again, the owner, in case of an investigation, in case of a complaint, in case it, uh, there's a violation of ADA of some type, and a complaint has been filed, someone with the Department of Justice will investigate that, and it will be between the Department of Justice and the particular owner to resolve the situation. Now, again, building design construction, we are largely regulated, regulated. We are enforced by states and local jurisdiction. Now, the ADA does not intrude upon the authority of governmental entities over the built environment. They're, they're not going to overreach in any of categories outside of what is under their authority of ADA. They're not going to tell you your structural components or footings or any of this. So traditionally also the ADA recognizes that most jurisdictions have some type of ADA review. Whether it's complying with chapter 11 of the building code, whether it is through ICC, ANSI, 177, or through some other means, there's some type of review, and they're confident that local building departments and local authorities do look at that. However, they don't, we, we're not given the end all say all authority as to any ADA issue. The standards apply nationally, regardless of which state you go to. And they also apply in addition to any state or local requirements or codes. Keep in mind, just because you receive a CO, an occupancy permit for any project that's issued by a local the building department, it does not ensure ADA compliance. Although we're very careful, it doesn't ensure that you are ADA compliant. This is the authority, Department of Justice. They will investigate any and all complaints. Now, the ADA does provide a voluntary process for which a state can be certified as meeting or exceeding the ADA standard. This certification ensures that this state or local government requirements are consistent with the ADA standards and are equal thereto. There are very, very few states that have their building accessibility codes certified with the Department of Justice. Most jurisdictions enforce just as we enforce. And when state or local codes are in conflict, if there's ever a conflict, You've got your state code, you've got your state regulations on what, you, what should be code for the ADA, whether it's approaches, whether it's a wheelchair ramp, whatever the case may be, if there's a conflict, ADA standards will take precedence each and every time. State and local codes will not have any authority to that end. So in summary, Many owners, developers, architects, our design professionals, we all share a common belief that if we obtain that building permit and a CO, a certificate of occupancy after completion of that project, 
then all of our requirements for accessibility has been met. Do be advised that is not the case, may not be the case, unless the state or local building code has been certified by the Department of Justice. Ours has not, nor has the state of Kansas. And building apartments, we're only authorized to enforce state and local codes. We do not have the authority to enforce ADA on behalf of the federal government, nor will we ever be given that luxury, so to speak. It will not occur. And also know that there is no formal approval process for ADA regulations. ADA enforces through litigation, period. They will not, for instance, I cannot call up someone with the Department of Justice and say, would you please look over this set of plans that I have to assure me that we are 100% ADA compliant. It will not occur. They do not have such a process. However, they will be more than happy to come and investigate anything that is in violation thereof and through the appropriate, appropriate litigation. It is ultimately the owner's responsibility to comply with all requirements of ADA and the architect and design professional is oftentimes and more often than not familiar with each of the regulations and they advise these owners on how to design and how to come up with this compliance. Always remember it is a civil rights law. It is treated as a civil rights law. It is enforced as a civil rights law and the Department of Justice will enforce same. It is not a building code and it is not a building law. Any questions or comments on that? city building code does, is that correct? Not necessarily. Typically they're one and the same and they'll remain one and the same. But what we enforce, we're enforcing the 2010 ADA standards as they are written, as does the state of Kansas. So what we look at is what is written in the ADA standards. Is 36 inches applicable? Is it not applicable? But it's more than just hallway width that becomes somewhat more confusing and we'll get into this probably in a different study session on design elements, on how to design uh, the proper widths, know that we have the proper widths, know that we're coming at the end of a corridor and we have to make a sharp right turn down another hallway, do we have the turn turning radius there necessary to make that transition? But we're also looking at, in design elements, what is projecting into that width? We're looking at 36 cl inch clear width if there's a design element there, say there's a column down your hallway and it just reduced that particular portion of your hallway to 31 inches, well, you're not in compliance. It's going from floor to ceiling. There's, there's a height restriction on how high an object can protrude out, how much it can protrude out. So we're not just looking at individuals too that are wheelchair bound, we're also looking at someone that may be sight disabled uh, blind, they need a cane, they need a walker, they need assistance of some type other than that. So for specific questions and the ones that you have, uh, feel free to stop by any time, Jim, to my office and we'll sit down with the standards and we'll make sure that we get that hallway designed as it should be with the proper width and with no obstructions in it and the proper radius for them to make the turn but a typical hallway per ADA standard uh, is three feet, 36 inches. Yeah, it was just a little confusing because the research I was doing showed on in the ADA 20, 2010 or the 1981 uh, adoption of it that they, the way I was understanding it was close to 42 inches. 
Not always. That's that gray area that we're talking about. And then and you, ha you have to look at, are you looking at a residential application or a commercial application? Commercial. Commercial application, 42 inches may take precedence then. And that's something that I'll do more research on. And you can stop by the office and we'll discuss that project and make sure we get it 100% okay. correct. Well, I'll, I'll just present the uh, building permit and be happy to review it, yes. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. Um, I assume that in areas where there are no building codes enforced in the county or whatever, ADA is still required because it's just uh, the Department of Justice will um, investigate it if there's Correct. a problem, a right? ADA is required on those 12 items that I mentioned, those 12 types of facilities, which as we all saw, covers just about anything that you can imagine right. that's being constructed. If it's constructed in the county, if it's constructed in a remote area that has no building codes whatsoever, ADA requirements are not exempt. Right, okay, and then. And that would be between the owner and the design professional to come up with the appropriate ADA standards for that particular facility, and if any complaints occur because that was not the case, they will be investigated by the Department of Justice. Speaking to those 12 types of buildings, um, on the multifamily, you said it's four or more units and then something about with an elevator. What is that exactly again? That, like that four, falls four, under four the town Four townhomes in a row, does that have to be ADA compliant? Not necessarily if it's privately owned. Okay. What we're talking about is four more units that has an elevator. So you have a residence, someone builds a residence, and again, that's not that doesn't fall, if it's privately owned and funded, it doesn't fall under the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. That's a different entity that falls under Fire Fair Housing Act, which is a different set of regulations, yet similar. So if I build an apartment complex and I have 27 units and I have three floors, I have an elevator in there to access those three floors, so then I have to be compliant. So there's a percentage factor that goes in that too, and it's based on not only Fair Housing Act, but the Fair Housing Act has in its roots HUD 504 regulation, which will mandate, well, how many units do I have to make accessible? How many units uh, need to be easily modified to be success uh, accessible? And that's what the Fair Housing Act's doing. So those four units, now, the easiest way to make this uh, compliant is to have all of your ground floor units ADA accessible or easily converted to such. Now, Fair Housing Act <coughs> not necessarily saying that they all must go in and see your grab bars are already installed or your uh, everything in this unit is gonna be 100% compliant. What will have to be compliant is the method of going through that apartment so your hallways have to be the correct width, those type <coughs> of things. Say you have no one that's wanting to lease your apartments at this particular time that has any disabilities or needs ADA assistance of any kind. They're not saying too that you can't rent an apartment to somebody else, however, if you do rent, the same apartment that you just rented to someone without disabilities must be easily converted to someone with disabilities. So when you did your rough framing, et cetera, you put in um, blocking for the grab bars, whether or not you install the grab bars, you've made accommodations for the grab bars to be easily added if need be. The width of the shower is already going to be there. Uh, Say you have standard kitchen cabinets in there and you wanted to keep standard kitchen cabinets for this particular individual that you're renting to. However, at the point where that apartment's gonna be rented to someone with disability, those cabinets must have blocking, et cetera, in there already built into your framework so that you can easily remove those and put in ADA accessible ones. So there's a lot of components into that. 
But that falls under the Fair Housing Act, whereas if it's privately funded and owned and operated, it's not going to fall under 2010 ADA standards. Okay. There's two other so entities that they must follow. Then my last question was, you said there was something about the Department of Justice can um, certify building. Right. There's a certification process, and I don't know. There's maybe two states, maybe three, that have went through the certification for the certification process. For instance, if, if the Department of Justice certifies the city of Salina, which and this oftentimes they're not going to do a local jurisdiction, what it's going to be through a state entity. Say they're going to certify the state of Kansas and what they have as their code now for enforcement. Well, the state of Kansas is mirroring what we have. But for instance, say they had their own code their own ADA regulations, and they were word for word exactly what the 2010 ADA standards mandate and require. There's a certification process, and it takes quite some time to do so. You fill out the paperwork, you submit all your information to the Department of Justice. <laughs> if it is approved, the Department of Justice will send then the state or the government entity a, a certificate stating that they are equivalent to the uh, 2010 ADA standard for accessible design. Now, what that would help with is by having that certification, the local, um, your building department, whatever on that level could review, uh, make determinations, no, this needs to change, this needs to be that, it needs to change to this, we're exactly the same as the ADA standards as presented by the Department of Justice. But what it will not do, even though you get that certification, if there's a complaint, the Department of Justice will still be the ones to investigate. They will not give you that level of authority. They can give you equality as to what your codes are, as to what your ADA standards are but they will not give you the authority to investigate or litigate. They will still do all those investigations in case of a p complaint. So that's why you see most jurisdictions do not go through that process, whereas what we review now and what we have in our Salina code, we are already looking at the 2010 ADA standard for every project that comes in and we look to see that what the design professional has provided to the owner is equivalent and mirrors that. We don't have the authority to enforce a complaint or violation thereof, but we're making very sure that it's mirroring the same language as far as what is being submitted. Again, the, it'll be the owner that's gonna be ultimately responsible for any violations as they become investigated by the Department of Justice. It's complex, it is indeed. But, but the uh, design professionals like Mike, uh, th they obviously they design those plans, architectural plans for ADA. Yes. Uh, right. We do, but and we're also responsible and that's, that's one of the hard pieces for as a professional is after the fact, when you get the complaint, say you've got a sidewalk or a ramp that you built it 20 years ago or 15 years ago, it was compliant, it's settled now over the years, and now it's not compliant, and now somebody complains. Mm -hmm. What you have to try to do is protect from yourself, you have to provide, try to provide documentation at the time it was built that it was in compliance at the time it was built for your own documentation, so when it, if it ever comes back on you, you have at least something to fall back, but it's not really guaranteed that it's gonna help that information so uh, here's here's a good example uh, how many of you have been to Disney World no, I, I may have been a couple times entertaining venue it is yeah. <coughs> Disney World has such strict regulations as it relates to ADA uh, it is enforced by group called Reedy Creek Development. They are the building code of Disney World. And the reason they're so strict, they can literally, 
uh, say they're pouring a sidewalk around one of their amusement park venues for the public to gain access to that venue. Before the concrete will harden, there will be individuals there from outside of Disney World with lasers, with everything you can imagine, to see if it's out any at all, so that they too can file a complaint and sue. It happens often, it happens much more often than people realize, uh, on a venue that size. That there are literally people out there that will, they, they make their living doing that. There's more than what you think. Indeed. I've been involved in that before and it's, yeah. I mean, it, before you can, before the joints in the concrete, somebody's <laughs> checking it. So it, it really can't be that detailed and complex on larger projects, but that, that happens quite often at Disney World, and, I'm, and most people aren't aware of that. Now, should it be 100% compliant? Yes. And believe me, they are probably among the nation's best in making sure it's 100% compliant. But there too, if there's any complaints that come in that's filed by an individual or a separate entity and it is filed with the Department of Justice, again, regardless of who you may be, either Disney World or the president, or you're going to be investigated by the Department of Justice. So it's, it's quite a challenge for the design professionals, quite a challenge for the owners, and we all work hand in hand to make sure that it is, is compliant as we possibly know that it is, or that no stone has been left unturned, so to speak. Many things happen on, on designs that projects are different. Not every project is going to be designed the same. Not all ADA requirements are going to be exactly the same on every project. So it's not something that you can go just one project to the next, to the next, to the next, and everything be the same. It may or may not be the case. Depends on the complexity, the number of restrooms, many, many variables. So hats off to the designers and the owners as well as we all work together to try to make sure all of our facilities are 100% ADA compliant. You're planning on having other sessions to go through these? I'll, I'll plan on having other sessions, other ADA sessions. Uh, specifically, let's separate what residential components are and, and get down to the, you know, as I said, the meat and potatoes, such as uh, how wide should the corridors be? If it's a residential application, if it's a commercial application, what should that turning radius be at the end of the corridor so we can make a 90 degree turn down another corridor? Dead end requirements. Uh, the design elements a little more so in future sessions. Through the BAB meetings? It, it will be through a BAB meeting, additional set study session. Good. That way we can keep up with our continuing education. And ADA in and of itself is something that I, was pr I could probably do study sessions on for the remainder of the year, and we still wouldn't feel a, have a full grasp of it. Of course, with Mr. McCall's assistance, <laughs> which may not be quite so painless. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's becoming so important anymore. It's always been important. So, you know, this, this is, it originated in 1968, the Civil Rights Act. It escalated from that. So, Architectural Barrier Act actually formed out of that. And then all the federal government entities are still under that. But if you look at the Architectural Barrier Act, if you had that book, you had the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design, and you look at the two, they almost say the same language. Almost. Almost. That's the key. <laughs> Again, that's federal. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Other business and uh, acknowledgments? We will continue bringing study sessions as we can. Now keep in mind for our uh, building advisory board is scheduled for July the 12th. I believe that's on a Tuesday. 
we will not be doing that particular bill in the advisory board. And in, in lieu of that, on July the 15th, I've already scheduled a chamber annex across the street, and we're going to have one more overview of the codes, basically the Salina Municipal Code with the amendments that we will see with our new code adoption. As a refresher to remind us all, uh, as we all know, this has been a two-year, almost a two-year project. And <coughs> in two years, some of your memories may be better than mine, but in two years a period of time, I may have forgotten something. So we'll do it one more refresher. Now we are inviting contractors, design professionals, and of course the building advisory board's gonna be in attendance. So in lieu of this sep the July 12th meeting, our July 15th meeting will in essence be our building advisory board meeting as well. So when all of the contractors, all of our design professionals, all of our audience that comes to that meeting, questions regarding uh, what we have discussed through all of our subcommittee meetings, et cetera, may be equally shared with all of us, uh, specific to say the energy code or whatever. So we will all have part in answering some of those questions and sharing with our design community and contractors where we reached the conclusions that we did and we came up with a, in my opinion, a very, very, very good Salina Municipal Code. Do you have the hours or time? Uh, the times will be from 9 a.m. till, I schedule it straight through five hours, which means we will be offering refreshments because you don't want to listen to me speak for five hours nor do I desire to speak for five hours. Uh, so there will be breaks <coughs> various times throughout the day, not necessarily a lunch break, but we'll take quite a few breaks so we can have refreshments. And it's gonna be an open forum discussion, basically. I'll present it uh, as quick as I possibly can. I think we can get everything done in, in five hours. If I, the fewer interruptions, of course, the quicker it could probably occur and one would still get credit for five hours, so something to think about there, too. <laughs> How is the uh, reception going as far as, have, have you had a lot of individuals sign up for it? We have had quite a few individuals sign up for it, and Debbie may know exactly how many. Already full. Already uh, full? Um, we had, I believe, 70 spaces is what we can max out over there. So we're almost maxed out. Oh, good. Yeah. What, do you have uh, an idea what we're looking for to try to send this to the city commission yet, or? We are, for approval. <laughs> as far as sending to the city commission, what we're doing now is getting it back into uh, the ordinance format as directed by the legal. We've also, also discovered recently, and we're in the process now, the, the numbering system for the Salina Code is a bit confusing. So through consultation with legal, we are now renumbering Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is what we know as the Salina Code for all the building codes. That's where our uh, building code, residential code, plumbing code, et cetera, is in chapel, Chapter 8. So we're numbering, renumbering to make it easily understood by both our design professionals and the general community as well. So instead of just have a chronological order of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as a section number, we're basically giving it an assignment, whereas from now on, the number of the section in the Salina code won't change. And everybody can easily identify, well, I'm looking at chapter eight. I know that chapter eight Article one, division four is the, the mechanical code, for instance. So we're renumbering to try to get that a little more clear. And as soon as that's done, yes, we are going forth. But you don't have really any. I don't have a concrete date, sir. Not at this point. By the end of the year. It is my hope, yes, sir. When, when, when they, if it is by the end of the year, will it go into effect the first of the year? Or? 
If it's at the end of the year when everything is approved, yes. Now, I anticipate this to go fairly quickly. Of course, that's still a lot of work on us and staff to do this renumbering thing, but I think it'll go fairly seamlessly. Uh, at that point, once it's presented to the city commission, I don't think there'll be issues there and it'll be approved. So as soon as they approve it, you know, we still have that 90 day grace period. So it could be possible even by, I'm thinking October maybe of this year that everything is complete. So we're close. You mean that when it that it will go into effect. It would be effective October, November, 2016. Effective and in 90 days or after the 90 days? After the 90 days. Would be like October, November. Which hopefully. means I have to get it before the city commission fairly quick. Yeah. Yes. Crossing my fingers on that one. <laughs> if you're trying to do everything, make sure we have everything right. That's the reason you're not pushing it to where we've got to be well, there next and, and week. And that's the reason day. that we follow suit with basically the way the international community does it as well. Every time there's a code cycle change, uh, the codes aren't just changed uh, because of one or two individuals or three individuals. It is national input every time these code bodies are changed. It's a three-year process. So we're, we're close on track with that as well. It's something, there's never something to rush into. Everybody's had their comments. We've had meetings and meetings and meetings and we, we ended up with something that the board and the building department and all of us know that this is gonna serve the city of Salina very well and for many years, or for a few years we'll say, until we do a code change cycle again. But it won't be quite as difficult, I don't think, next time. I just don't. There was a lot of things in there that should have been removed, I'll say, probably several years ago. So we're close. So does that mean that you're gonna start another uh, code Cycle, uh, if I immediately do so, sir, I don't think I have time to do anything else, and I'm not sure that my supervisor, which he's left, <laughs> would allow me such that. I mean, I literally, if, if that's all that we did was go through the code chain cycle, it, it, it's quite consuming, and I wouldn't have much time to do anything else. And there has been some speculation through the international community that it may go to a six-year cycle because of that fact. It's difficult, well especially for a local jurisdiction. That's why I was asking, <coughs> I mean, if you're gonna go through a three-year code cycle in a six-year year, then you've got to start It's time to start year. the next one, that's correct. Now, those at the international community that are in Washington, D.T., that has people assigned to that, and that's their only duty uh, it's, it's can be accomplished, so to speak. Any other questions? That's all I have. Future, any future topics? Suggested topics? Our suggested topics, our future topics will, probably the first ones are gonna be a little more toward, a little more education on the ADA regulations, trying to get us on board with that. Uh, Beyond that, I'll keep everyone posted. But I will try to have some type of educational uh, study session of some type with each and every one of our meetings, unless there's some specific business that needs to be addressed. And that way we keep abreast as much as we can of all of these codes and as complex as they are, it's good to have such refreshers, I think. Okay, then uh, there's still two uh, openings for youth members on the board. Any uh, expression of interest forms may be obtained at our website. Uh, if I can read that, uh, it's clear. <laughs> but you can get that on our web, see it's Lina. Yes, they're readily available at the City of Salina's website. Salina-Kansas.gov. And if there's no other business, we're adjourned.